Good evening. Welcome to Vibin' with Ashley Live. I'm your host, Ashley Live. This is episode 155, and tonight my guest is singer-songwriter from Brooklyn, New York, D-Train. In 1982, he released his debut album, and the songs from that album were You're the One for Me, as well as Keep on. During his musical career, he's released six albums and continued to share his gift of making beautiful music. On April 6th, D-Train will be performing with Alisa Fiorello at Myron's in Las Vegas. So, yep, yeah, I'm going to hang on tight and wait for D-Train to hop in the room, and then we're going to get this interview started. Hi, Andrew. Hello, hello. Hi, guys. Hello. Oh, there he is. Hi, D-Train. <clears throat> Request to join my live and we'll start this interview. Hi, guys. How is your Saturday night going? Hi, D-Train. Hey, we got you, girl. How you doing? Yes. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on my show, D-Train. Um, I was saying earlier how I met you at Sirius. Right. And Many moons ago. <laughs> yes. We met back in 2008 at Sirius Satellite Radio when you were doing your show at Sirius. Yeah, I was up there from 2001 to 2008 uh, under B.J. Stone on Heart and Soul 51, which yes. used to be called The Express in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's go back to your career being a radio personality on Heart and Soul. Talk to us about that. Well, you know, it was interesting. My radio career actually began as a musician. Mm -hmm. um, when my records were hitting... Uh, you're the one for me and keep on and walk on by BJ Stone who is the was the head of the uh, programming director of the R&B division up at Sirius yeah. we used to go to Hubert and myself my writing partner we used to go down to Boston Massachusetts and perform at his birthday party oh, cool. oh, really? so he would play our record <laughs> so, so we did it for a number of years and then when BJ came to New York he wound up being a producer uh up there at, at Sirius Satellite Radio, and I wasn't even his original choice. His original choice was Will Downing, but Will really, was like, yeah, he told me he was like, "You aren't even my original choice." I said, "Well, gee, thank you very much." <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, Will was, couldn't do the gig, so I took the gig, and um, he trained me for three months, and then he set me free, and. I was just me on the air, you know, and they were having meetings about me because I was saying some wild things when I first got on the air. I'm just being myself, you I know. know. And, and, but you know, they enjoyed it because they said he's having fun. Yeah. You know, I didn't sound. I didn't want to go. They go, heart and soul, fifty one, and we love you guys out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the cool thing about radio, though, is like you just find your own voice and like you do what works best for you, and so. So he did, you said he trained you for about three months? Trained me for three months. And one of the things I learned from accepting that gift in radio, which was sort of paramount to what I accepted earlier, like my career started in 1981 with my hit record, You're the One for Me. Yeah. And when I, I got to have like nine top 10 hits before right. music started to change in 1990. Yeah. with the introduction of New Jack Swing and Teddy Riley and Keith Sweat and those guys yeah. uh, swinging it into the 90s. Um, so I was offered opportunities to come overseas. And so I took my music and I went over to Europe and France and stayed over there for like from 1990 to 2000 almost working yeah. and doing shows. Yeah. But I also was here in America doing jingles in New York. So mm -hmm. I became one of the top jingle singers, thank the Lord. Uh, you know, before jingles ended, yeah. um, doing uh, television commercial commercials uh, for the Army, for the Navy, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. you know, Wendy's, all of that stuff. So learning commercials, I learned how the advertising world works, and I learned about collaboration because you're all the time, unless you're a soloist, you're in a group setting. Yeah. So you have to learn how to blend 
And I learned a lot about how to blend with other singers who didn't have the, my same tonality, you know? Yeah. And I got to work with a lot of great, great artists, you know, um, Valerie Simpson from Atrid and Simpson, Luther Vandross was in some of those sessions, Fonzie Thornton, yeah. Robin Clark, who used to be on Sesame Street with Luther. Cool. Um, yeah, and so many, um, so many great people. And, and so from Jingles, I transitioned into radio when BJ called me, and I was going to say no. I really was. Wow. Not more. Because what happens is you learn more about yourself when you face your fears, because everything inside of you, when somebody offers you an opportunity, especially if you're not sure of yourself, you go, I can't do that. No, that's not cool. No, 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 no. I, I'm going to bomb. Yeah. And I said, yes. I didn't know a thing about radio. I knew how to answer questions because I've been an artist for many years. Yeah. I didn't know how to ask them. And on serious, you got to ask the question and shut your mouth. <laughs> so I was like, so how was your day? Okay. <laughs> because who we are, we just talk and talk. We don't shut up. Yeah. And we, we kind of talk over each other because we're so glad to see each other and we're like bubbling with information. So we're like, hey, Ashley, how you doing? We're going to ask you something. So what, what happened? So let me tell you something. So, so. <laughs> and it just goes on and on and it never stops and it's back and forth and it's reciprocal. Yeah. Where what, what I had to learn up at Sirius was how to be quiet. Yeah. I'd let them give an answer and not say a word and then just ask the next question. And not be it couldn't it couldn't always be conversational. That yeah. was the only thing that uh, made me feel a little weird about it because it was like mm, I wanted to talk with him yeah. instead of to him. You know, I mean, it, it, some parts of it was natural, some parts of it was unnatural because the questions and the the prep that you have to do was kind of weird because, like, when when you have people up there that you know, yeah, you know. I'm in the studio with 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 uh Dion. You know, I work with Dion work live. You know, so yeah. if I'm gonna ask her a question, I'd be like, "Hey, Dion, so anyway, what was that you was eating last week when we were doing the gig and sound check?" You know, I would. <laughs> I would say that. But being that you're on radio, you gotta go. Your your career began in 1968, and uh, and in your mind, you go. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? Eight years of it, it made me a better person. I learned a lot from it. It was fun. And now I've come full circle back into the artistry side of my life, yeah. uh, working with brilliant musicians, uh, with Rob Mathis. We've done Christmas concerts at Purchase College for 25, no, 26 years. Awesome. 20 years. And we had all the top musicians uh, in New York. And we've had a lot of guest artists like Vanessa Williams, who has become a friend of mine. Yeah. And Sting recently in the last two years, one day he just popped up with his bass at one of our concerts. He goes, you mind if I sit in? And I was like, and everybody in the band is going, what do you mean, do you mind if you sit in? Fool, don't you know you're staying? <laughs> just take the guitar out of my hand and go on stage. <laughs> you know? Everybody was like, like awestruck, as they say in Great Britain. They were gob smacked. Yes, they were gob smacked. So <laughs> he got on stage and he sang an Irish lullaby, and it was a beautiful lullaby. Yeah. And oh, a British lullaby. I forgot where it came from. I think he might have wrote it. But the first year he did the lullaby. Second year he came out, he did all of his hits. Mm -hmm. He was the whole second half of the show, and it was wonderful. And he came off and hugged everybody. Yeah. Because you know, I was shocked that I was getting hugged by Sting because he's so stoic. You know, when you when you're around Sting, he's like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you ready to go, yo, man? What's happening, man? What's happening? How you doing? <laughs> you're like, is he in a good mood? Is he not? I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, because what was weird when I when I got to work with him and we're waiting backstage to go on stage because we were singing backgrounds behind him. I was like, you know, you and I first met in 1984, top of the pop. When you were doing synchronicity, and I was on there doing "You're the One for Me," and George Duke and Stanley Clark was on there. Yeah, he was, he was like this. <laughs> I just said, "Well, I won't ask again. I just won't ask again." <laughs> You're like, "Are you are you okay that I said that, or are you just thinking?" Right, you don't like, know. 
it's just like like when we first started the Christmas concerts, it was the 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 poetry of Langston Hughes mm -hmm. being recited by Ossie Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. And with, in between, he, he would read a poem. Then Vanessa Williams would come out and sing. Then he'd read another poem. Then Michael McDonald would come out and sing. Mm -hmm. Then he would read another poem. And then David Sanborn would come out and play. Yeah. And all behind all of them, they had a live orchestra, choirs, the whole, you know, bells and whistles. And so in between segments and intermission, they were getting ready to do Mr. Davis's mm -hmm. makeup. So I walked up to him because I saw Buck and the Preacher. And I saw all of, you know, Porgy and Bess and all of those things because I was a kid growing up. And I said, you know, I love your film, sir. I, 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 really, I really do love your film. How, what's it like living up here in Westchester? Because Purchase is in White Plains, Westchester. Yeah. So, uh, no, I said, what's it like living up here in Connecticut? And he goes, young man, here <laughs> is not Connecticut. Here is Westchester. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well taken. Won't bother you again, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because when you live in the city for so long, anything like ten minutes north, you're like, oh my gosh, we're in a we're in a different place. We're in a different land. We're in a different planet. You know what exactly, I mean? Exactly, exactly. So I want to talk about your childhood. What sure. did music mean to you during your childhood years? My childhood years, I started singing in church when I was six. So I grew up in a very religious experience. Yeah. My mom went to church dog near five days a week. Mm -hmm. or seven days a week if you want to count Sunday. Yeah. And so from the age of six years old, uh, we were in church every Friday and every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and Sunday, I mean all day Sunday. <laughs> from <laughs> 11 in the morning to like almost seven at night. Oh, wow. Until we became teenagers. And then we were in the, the big folks choir, the young people's choir, and we did broadcasts on WWRL. Yeah. So we would sing for morning service, go home, have dinner, come back, young people's service in the afternoon. And then after that, kids would sit around the church. Then after that, testimony service at 7 o'clock. And after that, 8 o'clock was radio broadcast. Yeah. And that lasted until 10. Wow. And that was my life until I was 19 years old. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. That went on from the age of 6 to 19. At the, at, the, at the age of 19, I said, Jesus, where are you? I love you, but I got to take a leave of absence just for a little while. I got a record I'm trying to do. <laughs> so, you know, because when you leave the church, they say you're going out in the world. Yes. And, uh, oh, you know, whether you're Catholic or whatever, you're leaving the religion. You're leaving the house of God. Yeah. So, but I had a lot of great influences because Ronnie Dyson, who had the record in the 72, uh, 1972, If You Let Me Make Love to You, Then Why mm -hmm. Can't I Touch You? He was our choir director. Oh, cool. And he was opening up for the spinners around the country, down the, out here in Vegas. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, his life ended through drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he became a heroin addict, so it, it didn't pair too well. Yeah. And I was the youngest one leaving out of the church, so they didn't want the same thing to happen to me, so they prayed over me. And then they let me go. And my pastor told me, he said, if you keep God first, then he will always make you second. And if you can bend, and my mother said this to me, I'll never get this, walking out the door, because I moved out of her house once I got my record deal at 21, mm -hmm. and I bought a house in Long Island. She mm -hmm. said, if you can bend your knees before God, mm -hmm. you will stand before kings. Wow. And I always remember that. She said, always bend your knees before God. That means always, in terms of what you're doing, come from a place of service. Mm -hmm. Come from a place of servitude and humility. Yeah. Because somebody needs what your gift is getting ready to give them. Definitely. So don't go up there with your ego and what you know how to do because your ego, and many years later, I found this out from a good friend of mine, Bobby Walker, who used to be the bodyguard for Run DMC. Mm -hmm. So D train, when you use your ego to do things, ego stands for three things: easing God out. Wow! And so I never forgot that. And when he taught me that, I said, "You got to drive." You know, we have to have a certain amount of ego to do what we do. 
Yeah. But childhood was was deep. I was a very overprotective kid. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the hood on Franklin Avenue in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So there was always there was never shootouts when we were kids because guys fist fought in the street with yeah. their hands. Naked. But in the in the late seventies, people started getting stabbed. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! The sneakers for for quarter field coats. Yeah. Um, you know, and I went to Erasmus High School, which mm-hmm. was um, which was the second proving ground for me because. Up until I went to Erasmus High School, from first grade all the way through ninth grade, I went to the white area mm-hmm. of Brooklyn, out there in Sheepshead Bay, on Avenue Homecrest, Homecrest and Avenue T mm-hmm. in Brooklyn, for people that know it. And and you know, it was temporary. It was primarily Italian. Yeah. You know, very Italian, very racist. Mm-hmm. You had to be on that three o'clock bus or you were not going to make it out of that neighborhood in a good position. I don't care if you was a kid. Because oh. racism was at its height. Yeah. With Martin Luther King, the protests, you're talking 1968 through 1972. Mm-hmm. You know, I started there in like 1967. So 1972, when I graduated, it was still the same. Right now, it's in that same area of Brooklyn, it's primarily Korean and a lot of other you know, other East Asian communities have joined in, East Indian, African American. So it's opened up its diversification a lot. Yeah. Um, I think the world in general has done that. Brooklyn has done that. Because Brooklyn was pretty much, when you get off the train, after you got off downtown Brooklyn by Willoughby Street, it was all black. Yeah. <laughs> it was all black. Going all the way back to East New York until you got to Queens, it was black. It was black and Latino. Yeah. Bushwick was Latino, Brooklyn bed style was pretty much all black. Mm-hmm. And so being in that situation, you learn how to get along with all people. Yeah. And um, I was I was blessed. My mother never really let me play outside with the other kids because in my neighborhood, a lot of the other parents drank mm-hmm. and fathers would be out there drunk on the, you know, in the old ghetto, men be out there with the bottle. And they just stand yeah. and sit on their stoop and they just, they get high or they yeah. sit on their fire escape and get high. Mm-hmm. And so my mother shielded us from all of that through religion and keeping us in church, which I'm glad she did because when I got into the business, yeah, you want your freedom. You want your first drink. Yeah. I didn't smoke cigarettes. I hated cigarettes. I tried it when I was 12 with my sisters on the playground and never did it again. Yeah. But, um, you know, you get in the business, you want to drink, you want your independence, you want to feel grown. Yeah. But because of that religious concept in the back of my mind, I knew how far to go. And there was always a line in front of me saying, don't cross that line. Yeah. <laughs> don't, because yeah. once you cross that line, mm, it's going to be a hard time getting you back in there. So I always had a line that I couldn't cross, and I've always had good people around me. Um, Jack Walker, who was my first manager, who was the father of April Walker, mm-hmm. who has Walker wear. She mm-hmm. used to house all the hip hop. She used to make clothes for all the hip hop art- artists in the uh, 90s. Naughty by Nature, Queen Latifah, yeah. yeah. Naughty Love. All of them was her clothing line. Mike Tyson even wore her clothes. So he was my first manager. Then after that, I had um, Tom Hoover, mm-hmm. who was probably my greatest manager because when he became my manager, He made me aware of everything that was going on in the business around me because so many times artists are naive. We have a naivety when we have a manager or people taking care of us. So we think all we got to do is get up, look pretty, get dressed, get on stage, sing, get out, have a drink, party, 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 till the next show, till the next town. Yeah. Tom saved me from myself. He saved me from myself in, in many instances. He saved me from my own ego. He saved me from my own nature. He saved me from my own party and instincts. You know, he said, oh, no, man. Okay, you had enough to drink out here. You need to go. If you're going to drink some more, go to your room. Because yeah. people don't need to see you out here drinking yeah. and being drunk and partying and stuff. And, and you know, because everybody's talking, you know. Everybody's <laughs> talking. And musicians, oh, God, the weed gossip. So, <laughs> well, did you see what he had on? My Lord Jesus. <laughs> I said, God, I mean, and, and poor women, y'all get the, y'all get the worst of it. It's like, Tom, are those her nips? 
Are those tights for real? I knew that was a weave, girl. That wasn't even her hair because she was bald. <laughs> yes, yes, she, I'm telling her mother, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to bring it back to when your debut album came out. Looking sure. back on it, what do you remember most about this time in your life? When my debut album came out, I was 20. Mm-hmm. My first son, Jamal, was born. Mm-hmm. I had just gotten married at 20. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I got married at 21. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I got married because I had two kids by that time. <clears throat> Boy, I was making babies fast. What you blanks? But, uh, <laughs> but um, to me, we were riding down Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, my partner Hubert and I. And Frankie, we first broke the record in the Paradise Garage, which was a huge club in Lower Manhattan in the Meatpacking District. Mm -hmm. Paradise Garage was a primarily gay club, but they did have straight nights. Uh, Friday night was straight night. Saturday, Sunday into Monday was all gay. Mm -hmm. So we took our acetates, which they used to call them the the demo, uh, you know, records, to Larry Levan. Mm-hmm. who was the premier uh, DJ of New York City and pretty much around the country at that time. He was the hottest DJ in the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, we took him to him, and he put the record on in the club. And as soon as he put the record on, you would have thought a bomb hit the floor. Yeah. Because if anybody who remembers the Paradise Garage, in the Paradise Garage, when you first came in, and remind you, this is a meat packing district. You were walking it up a ramp into a warehouse that turns into a club, and when you get inside, there's a red British phone booth mm-hmm. where men were making out with men. Uh-huh. And at 21, I was like, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mama, I'm sorry. You're like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, this was the first, my first introduction to the gay lifestyle. Yeah. I'd never seen that before. This is a yeah. kid that grew up in church. So when I see the two guys make, and they had a movie theater inside of the club. And I'm talking about a 40 seat movie theater where guys would go sit and get high or have sex uh-huh. right in the movie theater. Oh, wow. Oh, it, it was deep. So Sodom and Gomorrah, or whatever you want to call it, it was that. But it was a part of the century. The sound in that club was amazing. And the yeah. people came there to dance. And I learned that most people came there to escape. Yeah. It was just an escape. And when the record went on and it blew up the club, he was like, oh, D-Train, oh, you got to come back here. Yeah. So I wound up working for Larry three or four times in his club, twice with my band and twice doing tracks with Hubert. Cool. The only weird thing about working in Paradise Garage was you did you got, you had to get there for sound check at six. Mm-hmm. You went out to dinner, you came back about eight or nine o'clock, club was opening up you go in your dress room at 10 you didn't go on until six in the morning what um, oh yeah why oh, yeah. six <laughs> i don't know why that was a dj question I, I still don't know the answer why but we got there at 11 did not go on till 6 a.m in the morning and wow. so after that experience we uh hubert took the records to wbls or joey bonner from Prelude Records, we got a a, a a single deal, and then they signed the album. Joey Bonner took the record to Frankie Crocker, mm-hmm. who was the chief rocker in New York and around the country. Everybody watched what he was doing yeah. on Kiss FM and on WBLF. And so when Frankie got the record, Hubert and I had to do an interview with him, and we're driving down Atlantic Avenue into Manhattan. I never forget this. So they played the B-side. Because back then, you know, you had the regular side with the radio edit, and then you had the 12 inch version. But on the B side, you had the instrumental versions, the remix. He was playing Francois Kevorkian's remix. And I was like, what happened? I'm sitting in the car, I'm like, where's my voice at? You took me off the record. I just would dare those feelings. All that hard work I put into the background vocals, I'm buried. And I'm sitting up there, and you were like, wait, 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 calm down. We are in the car going to the radio station, Ashley. I said, wait a minute. So he said, so we got to the radio station. I looked at Frankie, I was like, he was like, 
little brother. I was playing the B version. I liked it. Flip <laughs> and flipped it over. <laughs> and then he played the regular side. And he played the radio version, and the phones just started ringing like crazy. And yeah. that was when we kind of knew we had a hit. Um, I, it was exciting. It was exciting. But, you know, for me, I had a family. So I wasn't into what – I had nobody – I had no barometer of a parent saying, okay, now this is what you did. Because my yeah. mom was in the church. She was into Jesus, God, whatever. Yeah. Daddy was working. Dad was – he was, he was an elevator operator for Kings County Medical Center. And so everybody is here. Nobody's, like, focused on what I'm doing. Even though my parents were very supportive of me, even when I played football. When I played football, my mother and my father came to every game without end. Rain, shine, snow, sleep. They were sitting in the stands. So they gave me their blessing in getting into the music industry. But after that, my career guide was either Hubert or Jack, who were my managers at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and so you listen to what's around you and you listen to their guidance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't have time to have an ego and think that I was good or nothing. You know, I, I used to try to rap the girls, and I don't know how Biggie Smalls did it because I was fat as he was. But <laughs> I was like, oh, they should have called me that little, what's that little tired thing that just, I forgot, what is it, Jiffy Lube and that big old fat tie? That was me at 21, baby. And, and so, with a Jerry Curl. Now, my Jerry Curl was fly, but... Yeah. My belly was <laughs> And it remained that way all the way through, I'd say, my fifth album. My fifth album, I got it together and lost it away. Mm -hmm. Because my first manager, Jack Walker, used to, you know, they wanted me to slim down for the album cover. Yeah. And he took me to Prospect Park. And <laughs> Prospect Park has a five-mile circumference on, on radius on the outside, yeah. three miles on the inside. So he said, let's do the outside. We'll do half a mile and come back. And I knew what it was because I did it when I played football. Mm -hmm. I ran the whole park twice when I played ball. So we started jogging and my lazy behind. <laughs> we got half a block. I was like, all right, I'm good. Let's go get some sandwiches. <laughs> now let's get some and I don't know, for whatever reason, from growing up as a kid, I love bologna sandwiches. So when Blunt Beach came on the scene over there by the Brooklyn Bridge in Manhattan, I was in like Laura Boyle Flynn, baby. I wanted me some blippies. I said, forget Prospect Park. We ain't got a job. Let's go get some blippies. Well, maybe some chicken. That'd be some good stuff. I was a fat boy, so I just loved to eat. I mean, when, when I first started working, I loved to eat so much, I went from a hot dog stand in Manhattan. Now, this is a kid expressing his independence. Just before I was 21, I went from a hot dog stand to a pizza parlor, <laughs> to Cat's Deli, in oh, wow. just to express to myself that my fat behind can eat. Oh, I can eat. Wow. <laughs> and Cat's Deli, for Cat's those Deli, people, those sandwiches are like this. Yeah, for people that, Cat, yeah, that don't know Cat's Deli, those sandwiches are big. Those are like stacked. You can eat it for two days. <laughs> Yeah, when you go to Cat's Deli, like when I go to Cat's Deli, I take the meat off of it and then I eat the sandwich and then I kind of like use the meat for like later, like the day uh, after. Those are some intense sandwiches. Oh, yeah, and it's so good. It, I, you know, those two were the places. Carnegie, yep. up on 55th Street, they, they cut their pastrami and stuff thin, yeah. but they piled it high. And then Cat's made it thicker. Yep. And it was a little bit slimmer, but oh my God, those sandwiches. Oof. Can't get enough. Thanks, I know, thanks, especially in New York, because you can get them anywhere. So it's just like, oh yeah, let's get the sandwich. And then you're like, probably shouldn't have eaten that much. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the only place that serves it right to me in New York, because I've never heard of another place, Junior's tries. Yeah. But uh, they overpriced their stuff. I've been a kid. I grew up on Junior's in Brooklyn, over there on Flatbush Avenue. Right. But, what happens is the more commercialized they became, yeah, they got ridiculous with their prices because the price of the slice of cheesecake is thirty five dollars. I like know, that. I know. Ridiculous. I said, oh no, 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 no! I used to buy a whole cake and take a whole cheese pie, cheesecake pie, strawberry cheesecake, take it home, and that would be like maybe twenty five dollars. Yep. 
Now that thing is, they have to like a hundred dollars or something like that. Crazy. Yeah, because it's in demand and people love it. Yeah, well, you know what it is too. New York for a number of years became a tourist state. That's why they opened up Juniors in Manhattan. Yep. See, I grew up in Juniors. I remember when Juniors burned to the ground. Yeah. In the late seventies, the whole downstairs burned, and then they had to rebuild Juniors all over again. It was closed for almost like six months. Oh wow. Yeah. So now, you know, when they came back, that was the rise of Carnegie. That was the rise of cats. You know, the Jewish community blew up Carnegie in yeah. New York. And then the celebrities, and yeah. every celebrity that ever did a movie in New York, come on, with New York law and order and all the things being filmed in New York the way it used to be before COVID. Yeah. New York was as big as L.A. Mm -hmm. Probably in some ways bigger. Yeah. Because we have more location spots and less licensing fees. You know, L.A., you, you got to worry about getting shot by a drive-by. <laughs> if you're shooting in the wrong place, well, in New York, you don't have that problem. You know, they yeah. shoot primarily from 92nd Street down. That was it. They didn't yeah. go to 125th Street start shooting movies. The only time they did that was in the black exploitation movies with Jim Brown, Fred Williamson, <laughs> and Jim Kelly. That was it. So I want to talk about the success of the debut album. You're the one for me. Keep on. I mean, these songs blew up. So when they started getting attention, like at the club and like they were playing them on radio, what was that like for you? I think the most surreal moment for me was that they were playing them everywhere. They yeah. were they was everywhere. And so we got invited to do Soul Train. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, Soul Train? Yeah. I got to learn how to dance? <laughs> and we got out to L.A., we met Don Cornelius, and I was just in awe because this man had five different Rolls Royces for each day of the week. What? I never seen them before. <laughs> Don had Rolls Royces in different colors, and they were parked at the Beverly Hilton Hotel where we were wow. staying. I never wow. will. Joey Bonner was like, that's his? That's his? <laughs> so I'm like, what? <laughs> I wow. know it's about the dog, but uh, so then you know we did the show, and then it blew up in Europe. It, it yeah. went to number one in England, and we were invited to do Top of the Pops. Yeah, and the first time we did Top of the Pops, Elton John was sort of on the downside of his career because mm -hmm. the disco era had gone out. Yeah, and um, you're talking eighties now, and this is before his comeback. Yeah, you know, and so he's just sitting in the green room hanging out waiting for Sting and the police did because they had just come out with synchronicity. Yeah. So they were on stage and Top of the Pops, unlike Soul Train, Soul Train, you go down, you sit in the trailer for 20 minutes, you go out and do your show mm -hmm. and then you just go back to your trailer and you go back out and you do your second song because you always had to perform two songs on Soul Train. Mm -hmm. So they paid you for two performances whereas Top of the Pops, you only get one performance. Mm -hmm. But they got you there at nine o'clock in the morning. You waited till one o'clock to do sound check. Mm -hmm. Then you did dress rehearsal at three o'clock, and then at six o'clock the show started. So you yeah. so it was almost like doing Saturday Night Live. You yeah. know, Saturday Night Live has the same formula. You go in the morning on Saturday, and you don't leave there till after midnight. Yeah, because skits get put in, get taken out, you know. And I've done Saturday Night Live several times, and it was fun. It was fun, yeah. but. Uh, again, back to the record, you know, we were in London, England. I'll never forget it. The first time, and this is when clubs were everywhere in the UK. And clubs were usually primarily above restaurants back yeah. then. Everything was pirate radio. There was a big battle between the BBC radio and pirate radio because DJs were broadcasting from their homes, which mm -hmm. was illegal back then. Yeah. Um, we walked down a full long block and every window and every club, we heard the other one for me. And I thought they did it on purpose because they knew I was coming. But no, it was just that the record was that popular. Wow. You know? And what, to prove that it was so popular, the record came out, the other one for me hit, and the other, uh, the other one for me hit number one in 1982. 
1984, it was remixed and re-recorded by Paul Hardcastle. Mm -hmm. And went back up on the top 15 in the British charts over again. So I had a hit record two times. Yeah. <laughs> by different people. You know, and yeah. so that's when you know the, the, the music has longevity. People want what's real. That's why when you listen, you know, going back to my days of serious real quick, I had to ask one of my favorite songwriters who I got to interview, Lionel Richie. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lionel, I said, what is it that you miss about the industry these days? I mean, and we well into 2010, 2011, and, you know, uh, mumbo jumbo rap had come out of the South, and, you know, I don't, I don't know what they call it. I'm not trying to disrespect it, but yeah. I don't know what they're saying. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My mom said, yeah, well, you know, 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 you you say it? you know, you know, you know, you you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, backwards you can remember the melody in the song yep you can remember the introduction to the song mm -hmm. all you got to hear is da -na -na -na, da -na 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 -na, earth 25 september what what you know yeah you yeah your hands up, you're ready do you remember uh, that thing uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh oh earth and the fire all of those were introduced to me in the 70s by my good friend, Will Downing. We went to high school together. So he introduced me to Stanley Clark, George Duke, to their music. Yeah. Um, and I'm grateful to him to this day forever. And he's gone on to become such a great artist. He's over in the UK now after a long while not being in the UK. And I told him, I said, make sure you do Love Supreme. That was your first hit over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a jazz god, but you know, I'm like, hey, dude, love supreme, love supreme, hey, love supreme, baby. <laughs> Bring back the Brooklyn love. Where's the love? Come on, it's Brooklyn, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Show me where Linden Boulevard came from. You know what I mean. Don't make me make you understand. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So. Obviously, your songs have been so popular, and so many people have sampled your songs. Notorious oh, yeah. G, Faith Evans, NWA. So of these people that covered your songs, which one is your favorite and why? I never heard the Faith Evans version. Mm -hmm. I love Yo-Yo and Gerald LaVert's version because Gerald's a great singer. Yeah. And I worked with Gerald on his father's albums. Yeah. I worked on OJ's albums in the studio with him. And then I got to do commercials with Gerald. Gerald was a very quiet person, but he was a very giving person. Yeah. He'd give him the shirt off his back. Um, so, and the way I found out that Yo-Yo um, had cut it, I was laying in bed on a Saturday morning. I'm not lying. Yeah. And I kept hearing, I believe you. And my ex-wife had Soul Train on. And I'm like, they think something's on your mind now. It's 1990, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? So... I get up and sit up in the bed, and she's on the stage, you know, doing her rap and stuff. And then all of a sudden, Gerald walks up on the stage. I believe. I said, oh, snap. Wow, this is interesting. You know, and, I, and it was cool. So Don Cornelius asked that. He said, so uh, why didn't you get the uh, the real Detroit? She said, I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him. I said, Jesus Christ, but you know what, Ashley? I tell you the truth. I'm glad to be here because I've been dead three times. Wait, what? I'm, yeah. What? People in Detroit called me for a show. When the 80s, when you fade from sight, people think you don't exist anymore. They called my house on three separate occasions and got mad with my ex wife and asked her, why didn't you invite us to his funeral? We heard that he was dead. And that, 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 and they were crying on the phone. And she said, well, you know what? The reason why I didn't invite you to his funeral, because he's in the living room playing video games with the kids, but if you want to talk to him, I can resurrect him for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is no lie. This is the truth. And crazy. Twice that happened, and then the third time was just before COVID. My sister-in-law, my ex-wife's sister, 
works in a clothing store in Manhattan. Two people from the church went into the clothing store and said, how come you didn't tell us he died? What, what happened, Peyton? Why, why didn't you tell us he My sister-in-law fainted. They had to get her medical attention. Oh my God. All because the church people went inside of the store and told her I was dead. I said, so that must mean I'm going to live a long time. Wow. Well, they're going to be long John Silver. Oh, I episodes about that. <laughs> but, Ooh, wait, you know, but, so, so I feel like maybe because your name is pretty common, maybe they just heard somebody else with the same person as your name and they thought that they had passed. Oh, there's plenty of little D trains out there floating around, but they cannot perform live. They cannot record yeah. simply because I own the trademark. I bought it in 2015. Okay. I only, the, only, the only thing regret I would say I had is that I didn't buy it even sooner. Because I thought that it was owned by the New York City Transit system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is the D train that runs through New York. And it is the D train I caught as a kid in the 70s when they had the QJ and the MJ, M train and all that stuff. Um, and the shuttle at Prospect Park. So my thing came from football. My football brothers gave me the name D train because I hit real hard. Yeah. But it really was a train. And so after Jack Black did the movie All Aboard the D-Train a few years ago, yeah. or Get On With the D-Train, whatever the movie was, um, I said, oh, that ain't going to happen again. So I went and I brought the trademark to the name. I said, if you're going to be it, then you should own it. And that was something else that I learned from my ancestors and different uh, people that I've worked with over the years. Harry Belafonte was one of the few people I got to work with several times, and he said to me, he said, young man, if you're going to be about it, then you need to own it. See, yeah. his story was one that I, I couldn't even imagine. And it was brought up in the 50s when he was, um, he did the movie, The World, The Flesh, and The Devil, in black mm -hmm. and white. Mm -hmm. And it was, apocalyptic, it was the first apocalyptic film about New York City being not overrun by aliens, but there was nobody left when he came out of the bank and nobody was dead. But yeah. Except for... Uh, I forgot the two other actors' names. And in real life, after the movie, after he won several awards for it, the film, I don't know if he won an Academy Award. I'd, I'd be misspoke if I said that. Mm -hmm. But he was the, I think he was the first or the second black actor to win one after mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier. Yeah. To serve love. But he's, he was trying to get into an apartment building, him and his wife, mm -hmm. on on Park Avenue because mm -hmm. he made the money. Mm -hmm. And they said, and they had the sign up there that said, you know, vacancy. And that was the premier place to live. Black people didn't live on Park Avenue, not in the 1950s and yeah. not even now that much, you know? That's mm -hmm. the one place that has not been gentrified. Yeah. So uh, he went up in there and the guy said, there's no vacancy, no vacancy. And I said, what do you mean? He said, that's what they told me. He said, but because I owned it, I called my account. I went to a phone booth and mm -hmm. called my account. I said, how much money do I have? He said, you got X, Y, Z. He says, okay, I want to buy this building. Is it for sale? He said, you can buy it. Yeah. He went back. He bought the building, paid for it, and went back a week later. And the sign was still there. And the guy was still there saying, you can't live here. The doorman said, wow. you know, there's no vacancy. He said, what's your name? He said, my name is blah, blah, blah. He said, okay, you're fired. What? You can't fire me. Who do you think you are? He said, I own the building now. Get out. Yes! That's something that taught, that's somebody that taught me among my many great mentors and teachers, own it. Because what happens is, in the beginning of your career, you're creating your history. Right. You're, you're evolving. You're changing. I'm 60 years old now. Mm -hmm. So now it's not only about change and create, cre creation, but it's about legacy. Yeah. Because on this side, you're walking down the hill. And mm -hmm. you're creating for not only yourself, but your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your children. Of course. And it's not what you have. It's what you leave behind. Right. Simply for this. Everything I own in this world, 
When I die, the day that I die, I can't take it with me. I could have twenty million in the bank. It's going to belong to somebody else. The first yeah. people in line, unfortunately, in our country, is the IRS mm -hmm. because they charge you leaving here. You're dead. <laughs> yeah. They're going to come to your husband, your wife, your mama, or your your daddy. Yeah. And say he owed me eleven thousand dollars. Then what you want to do about it? And they will come to your family and tax them because in America. That's the unfortunate thing. Yeah. You're taxed when you earn a dollar. Mm -hmm. So when you, they take the taxes out of your check. Yeah. When you put it in the bank, you're taxed again. That's twice, right? Mm -hmm. Then after you take it out of the bank and you buy something or pay your rent, you're taxed again the third time. Yeah. And then if you make too much money, they gonna tax you again. <laughs> mm. So you can tax four times for earning that one income. That's now, crazy. how is that supposed to be the right way of doing business? Yeah, it's crazy, but that's yeah. what it is. Whereas what I've learned from traveling to places like Amsterdam, like Great Britain, we may not like the way their society is run by queens and kings and monarchs or whatever. Mm -hmm. They take out more money of your check in Great Britain than in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. If you earn a hundred thousand dollars, they may take out forty. Yeah. But what happens is, the thing that they give you in return mm -hmm. is healthcare. And we all learned about healthcare during COVID nineteen. We sure did. <laughs> and one thing that COVID nineteen taught us is that. It was created to extenuate the gap mm -hmm. between the rich and the poor. If you had great health insurance, you got the great medicine, your COVID was gone. Okay. If you did not have good health insurance, well, <laughs> some of y'all didn't make it. And that was horrible. Yeah. If you didn't have health insurance at all. So then that caused another distrust in our society with all that was going on. And then amongst all the COVID and all of that going on, and I don't mean to go off on a tangent, they killed George Floyd on TV, you know, and yeah. that, changed, yeah. uh, that changed the youth of America mm -hmm. forever. Because see, back in the 60s when we protested, it was black people by themselves, but a few people, white and Latino, sprinkled in. Mm -hmm. But now, you got my friends who are wealthy up in Connecticut. Their little white children was out there protesting and marching in Brooklyn and yelling and screaming. Yeah. And you know what? And they were screaming, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And what happened was it taught the world to look upon us as a nation because what happens is that killing, which they thought would separate us, yeah. brought us closer together. COVID brought us closer together because why we couldn't see each other anymore i couldn't see you yeah i couldn't see you. i couldn't see it. anywhere from your nose down to your chin i couldn't see because you had a mask on right you know? and so we lost touch with who we are visually we couldn't even go to our cousin's house or family house we were on quarantine I mean, I lived in New Jersey at the time, but it was like, look, nine o'clock, you got to be indoors unless you go to the supermarket. Right. Yeah, yeah but the it curfew crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I felt like I lived in Russia or something like that. You know, China. I, I didn't know what it, this was. It was crazy. Yeah. But in the end, after all was said and done, when they sang We Shall Overcome this time and marched on the Capitol, it looked like somebody pepper sprayed that thing because... They were all there together, black, white. And Martin Luther King's dream came alive in this youth. Not our youth, but in this youth. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that what I see now, there's so many interracial marriages, and kids nowadays, especially my kids, don't see color. You know, my son, my son is married to a French-Canadian woman, so it, they don't see color. They don't see black and white, yellow. They see love. Mm -hmm. Which is what it should have been all along. They see love. Yeah. You know, um, economics isn't about green. It isn't, you know, people think that it's about money. Money is a commodity that we use 
every day. Yeah. But it's the it's the it's what's behind that dollar that constitutes who gets it, who mm-hmm. doesn't get it. And it's like you see it in our society every day. The homeless situation after COVID has just gone. It's exploded, especially out here on the West Coast in California, where people can sleep underneath the bridges. Yeah. They can't stop that because they can set up shanty towns out there, out here in Vegas. You know, they're on the highways. Every, you know, just overpass you pass. And, you know, they don't have subways to go into. Yeah. But they can lay down on the street. They get harassed by the police, just like in New York. But if you're going to harass me, then build the shelter. Yeah. Don't tell me I can't stay out here on the street. I ain't got nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. And I ain't got no money to get there. Definitely. So build a shelter and put me in it. I'll go. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, what I've learned as I've gotten older, I don't blame anybody for anything. I hold myself accountable. I say, you know what? It's on me. Yeah. If I didn't do it, then it ain't going to happen. Mm-hmm. And if I don't make it happen, it's not going to happen. Period. You know, as a New Yorker and as a, a person like that, it's like New Yorkers, we talk fast, we move fast. When you get into Manhattan, I lived in Jersey for eight years. Yeah. And I and I raised my children in Long Island. But I knew once that train pulled into Penn Station, you better walk as fast as everybody else is. Your okay. strength level is going to go up from here. You might have been calm on the train. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? Ready for street Penn Station? Last stop, he was like, oh, okay. Because yeah. mm. now you got to fight to get through the crowd, fight to exactly. get a taxi cab, fight to get on the subway station, might miss four trains because three of them was crowded. <laughs> you, can't get them. you know, it's just the life of being a New Yorker. So yeah. you want to do your job. Yeah. So yeah. You, lived in New- you lived in New York for most of your life, but you currently yeah. live in Vegas. So talk to us about being in New York for most of your life, and then what made you say, you know what, by New York, done with you, I'm moving to Vegas? I think after being in New York, you said I'm 60, 59, 50. so when I turned 58, mm-hmm. uh, Jersey, you know, we were still going through COVID with Cuomo and stuff, 2020. Yeah. My job, at, uh, I was working for United Stations Radio Networks, which was a company owned by Dick Clark, the late Dick Clark, who had American Bandstand. Yeah. I was a musical director there. Um, and I was sort of like contract work for hire, but I was still doing work for other people, like serious. I still do all the voice imaging for the group. So what happens is they shut the offices down because the president of the company got COVID twice. Wow. And it's on Madison Avenue, which is an affluent area. Right. We're right around the corner from Rosanna Scotto's two restaurants. So what happens is, and it's a primarily medical building. Mm -hmm. So COVID coming into a medical building, they shut the building down, period. Of course. Everybody go home. Everybody's furloughed. You don't need to come back into the building. We'll pay you to the end of the month. After that, See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Wow. And that's that's what happened with United Stations. Um, and a lot of people stay. A lot of people go. I still do little things for them. Not much, but, you know, um, I'm thriving off of live gigs and shows at this point until my other projects get off the ground. Yeah. You know, um, what happens is with New Yorkers, my and that song is the truth. If I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. In New York, in New York, the, the, the most surreal thing that ever happened to me in my career in New York, for my record, you're the one for me hit, and then Keep On came out after it. I was doing a club called Bonds International mm-hmm. on 45th Street and 7th Avenue, mm-hmm. which is now a shoe store. Mm-hmm. There was a back door that you could go in on 45th Street that had a fire escape up. You had to go through the downstairs door. Fire escape they used to use when people want to go outside and smoke weed or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I got there and I arrived in, you know, back then when the record was hitting, you riding in limos. Yeah. You ain't catching the bus. You ain't riding with your boy. You ain't looking for a parking garage. You in a limo. Mm-hmm. You in a stretch. So I roll up in the stretch 
And the police were there. And I was like, oh, crap, what happened? Did somebody do drugs? Because, you know, <laughs> drugs and weapons, I guess it's somebody that fell out on No. The police were standing there in riot gear. Full wow. riot gear, like Michael Jackson was getting out of the car. Oh, my gosh. Came over and escorted us from the club, from the car into the club because the line was going from 45th Street and 7th Avenue all the way down to 6th Avenue and around the corner. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was down to 6th Avenue. I, I, I thought I was seeing things. I, I, I didn't know what the people. And, you know, it was like 11 o'clock at night, midnight. You said, damn, these people here, what, they buying some Michael Jordan shoes? What's up? <laughs> what's up? No, they were there to see D-Train. And it was amazing. That was surreal. Having police in riot gear at one of my shows. That's and then the other, the other moment for me, which wasn't so surreal because I took it like a gig. You're older now. You've worked with Michael Jackson. You've worked with Luther Vandro. So celebrity things don't blow you out. Um, was doing Madison Square Garden for the Pope. Um, that was amazing because I realized Catholics, the Catholic religion is a very powerful religion. My ex-girlfriend, who was a Latino who passed away, she was a devout Catholic. Her mom was a devout Catholic. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't know what they were that many Catholic. <laughs> I'm just saying. When I got to the auditorium, the security again, because it's Pope Francis, yeah. was deeper than Michael Jackson because the line started right at Penn Station. Uh, when you go around that East Avenue side to go to see the New York Knicks and you got to go through that door. Yeah. The line started there, went down 7th Avenue to 23rd Street. Down 23rd Street and 7th, back to 23rd and 8th, and back up 8th Avenue to 33rd. Wow. That's how many people were trying to get in. And there was already maybe 15, 20,000 people already seated. Cool. And I'm talking all clergy. Yeah. From all over the world. So I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. The only intimidating thing to me at that gig was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I kept asking. I know the Pope is the man, but that was the biggest Jesus that I had ever seen. I was going to come back to life. I was, what is he? He looked like Ken Kong up in there. So I'm like, wow, that's the biggest Jesus. I was like, how did they make that thing? How did they go get it out of here? <laughs> it was a big white Jesus. He just sat there on the cross. I said, "What's well, what I got off the cross. <laughs> I'm getting mixed messages here. But, uh, <laughs> but it was cool. You know, it was a good game, man. And, and because security was the way it was, I gave my son my ticket. My son's an opera singer. Mm -hmm. And I got him in with me. And he went to see. I seated him with my friends from Kathy Baruso. Kathy Booth came, Kathy Ian Cohn came from uh, United Stations, and they sat with my son and Charlie, uh, Charlie Colombo and his wife from the United Stations, one of the vice presidents. I had him and his wife from there, and it was fun. They enjoyed it. I said, you know what? He may talk too slow for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might keep he said what he means to say is that he loves you. I was like, no, 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 I can't do this. And then <laughs> afterwards, have to get on those escalators and go through security to get out of that. Oh, no, 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 no. It was a gig to me. I was like, be the gig, love you at peace. Where's my check? Thank you very much. <laughs> God, I gave my son my ticket. I'm out. Said my goodbye to Martin Sheen, who I hung out with him in his dressing room. Mm -hmm. And he was a beautiful man. Beautiful man, devout Catholic. Uh, so I hung out with him for a while and um, got to meet his son, who is his, I guess, his road agent, not Julio. And uh, uh, no, wait a minute. Okay, there's Charlie, then there's, I forgot the other one that was in the Western movies. And there's an older brother, older than Charlie. Mm -hmm. He's the one that travels with Mr. Sheen. Yeah, but he's a sweet man. And yeah. uh, so that was, you know, meeting celebrities, we do that all the time. We've done it a million times. So that part of the fanfare isn't like, ha, oh, to us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think one of my biggest disappointments working up at Sirius was 
being called to be in the movie Perfect Stranger with Bruce Willis and Halle Berry. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'm working on the BJ. I'm like, BJ, they called me to be a principal lecturer. I'm going to be the band leader in the movie. <laughs> so BJ starts spreading it around the company. Him and Kathy, oh, here we go. Everyone, you know, D-Train's going to be in the new movie. And they had my trailer on Park Avenue and 42nd Street, right in back of Cipriani's restaurant. Oh, wow. So, and I had my name on it and everything. So I took pictures and sent it to BJ. I said, put it on the bulletin board. Yeah. Well, the red carpet event comes out. <laughs> I take my ex-wife to it. I'm like, I'm on that movie. I get to the movie and I'm waiting for the scene. And Tyler Berry and Bruce Willis, like most actors do, they're sitting over there in the back because they get up before the end of the movie so people don't start asking them questions. That's the way most of them do it. So Bruce and Hallie were sitting in the back, Gianni Rabisi, and uh, I'm sitting there waiting for my scene. Both songs that I sang were in the movie, but I didn't see me singing them. <laughs> so when the song is over, Bruce Willis stands up to give a toast. Yeah. And uh, I sang My Funny Valentine. Mm -hmm. and he was dancing slow with his wife. And at the end of My Funny Valentine, he goes, I'd like to propose a toast. And he gets up on stage. And he gives me a high five, and I'm the, I'm a silhouette. Ashley, I was a silhouette. You couldn't see my Aww. black face. My black face was blacker than blue. I mean, <laughs> I was the shadow on the stage, so you never knew who it was me. Except if you ain't no shape in my big head, you wouldn't have known it was me. <laughs> That's messed up. They should have shown you. Oh, Ash, and then I, I had to go back to work the next day. I was like, oh. yeah. <laughs> Oh my I went gosh. In the studio to do my tracks. I was like, B, can I go in the back? You know, them studios that's way in the back. Yeah. Be <laughs> in Studio 12 and nobody can see me. Oh, I didn't want to be seen, honey. But you know the fun was meeting her on the set. You go because because we're around so many celebrities, we don't get caught up in that. Yeah. So I was sitting behind the cameraman and I'm just watching the movie, watching actors do their scenes. Because, you know, when you do films, most people think it's glamorous. It's a bunch of waiting around. Because yeah. you get, you got to be there at 6 in the morning, but your scene may not be till midnight right. or 1 o'clock. They try to get it in by midnight, but once they go over midnight, well, them SAG rules go into effect, and after rules, and then they got to start paying overtime. Right. And then they rush in to hurry up and get you on the scene and get you off. Um you know, we've done that several times. You know, I was in the movie Keeping the Faith with Ben Stiller, Ed Norton. Um, and that's another place I got a high five. Singing Ain't Kalo Hey Do Around the Altar on 96th Street. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm sitting behind the cameraman and the producer of the film comes to me and says, she wants to meet you. I said, she who? And I thought it was, I got nervous first because I'm married. And we're doing a scene where all the extras are in negligee. They look like a room full of Victoria's Secret models. And I was like, which which one wants to meet me? <laughs> so so uh, she said, no, come with me. So she grabbed me by the hand. She takes me all the way around to the other side of Cipriani's restaurant behind this wall. And there's a little sofa bench there. And there's Halle Berry. Mm -hmm. And she's sitting there studying a the script. And she looks up and goes, Detroit, Detroit, I don't know your records. And I was like, I freaked out, Ashley. I was like, oh. <laughs> Talk about moonwalking backwards. I, I beat Michael Jackson doing this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Michael couldn't have done it no better than me that day because I was scared to death to touch it. I was like, oh, so nice to meet you. Too. I stuck my hand out longer than it could have been in my arm socket. Oh. And, uh, she shook my hand. She knew I was nervous. And then we greeted each other, and she told me she had all my records, and she was a big fan, and she was thanking me for doing her movie. And so then afterwards, I, we were talking about different agencies to get signed with, uh, you know, creative artist agency, who she was signed to at the time. Um, she said, if you want to get into film, get with creative artist agency, and it, they made me work for your career. Um, so, you know, those are things that I learned from her. Even though in the middle of the film, she switched agencies. She left Creative Artists Agency and went with somebody else. Oh, wow. um, oh yeah. Before the rap party, she was with somebody else. But this is the other crazy thing. I get to the rap party, 
And if people don't know what a rap party, that's like when you finish a film, it's like a celebration party. It's like a after the Grammys, they go to different parties. So they had a rap party for the film. And I was hanging out with Kathy Kosi, who was a set nurse. Very nice lady. And I brought my ex-wife with me. And we're sitting there with Kathy and we're talking. So my ex goes upstairs and she goes to get some food because Gianni Rabisi is on the grill. I was afraid to go up there because he was lit. He was hanging <laughs> with the king's sauce with a little pepper in That's like, I don't know how he's freezing in that food. I mean, I mean, he's like, he's Gianni Rabisi, but you know, he ain't Gianni Rabisi right now. So, <laughs> so what happens is she goes upstairs, Hallie's limo pulls up, she comes inside. Everybody runs to the door. And I'm like, okay, she's here. Nice. So I'm standing on the side. So she comes over to me, and I'm like, oh, boy. This ain't good. So, hey, how you doing, baby? <laughs> how you doing? I said, I'm good. She said, where are you sitting? I said, uh, well, I'm sitting over there with the set nurse. And she says, okay, I'm sitting with you. <laughs> My ex-wife is coming down the stairs at this time. I said, I'm going... Jesus, forgive me for all of the sins that I've ever had in my life. I don't know. But, and she sits in my wife's chair. Oh, wow. Oh, you're talking about your shoes getting heavy and your body getting light? <laughs> and I didn't even have a drink yet? I was like, what? Oh, boy, this is going to be interesting. So she walks up to my ex-wife and she goes, oh. And she's sitting there in my expo. She comes down with her plate of food. She goes, oh, are you sitting here? She says, yes. She says, she says I'm with him. I'm his wife. She goes, oh. Oh, I didn't know. He didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a chance. It ain't my fault, Hallie. You, did that. you didn't give a chance to ask you. <laughs> so she sits down, and then Hallie goes to the table right next to mine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, we took pictures and everything, and BJ probably still had him in his office. And, uh, you know, she was a beautiful person. She was very kind, and um, it was wonderful working on that film. And when I went out and got the DVD of the film, mm -hmm. I was more surprised at the DVD because I don't usually watch films that I'm in. I've never seen Keeping the Faith with Ben Stiller and Ed Norton. I'm in the movie, but I now that movie, when the doors open, there's Detroit. Yeah. But I've never even seen the film. I'm in the movie A Walk in the Park with Richard Gere and Winona Ryder. Never seen the movie. Wow. Yeah. Did the Muppets movie, did Hercules. But well, those are cartoons. They could have made a D-Train cartoon singing Zero to Hero, but yeah. hey. You know, they didn't do it during Pokemon. So hey. Yeah. Pokemon was my big claim to fame with the kids of today's generation. Even yeah. the adults now, they go, you the guy that was singing Pokemon? Pokemon, Pokemon, and I said, yes, at least 150 or more to be, to be a Pokemon, this is my destiny. You go, fuck it up, Pikachu, Pikachu was the only name that I could remember with my OCD self. Was, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Pikachu, he's, he's one of them. <laughs> so D-Train, talk to us, what's happening April 6th? April 6th, we are going to be at the Smith Center, baby. Go to the Smith Center website, get your tickets. It's going to be myself and Elisa Fiorello, who is formerly of the group uh, New Power Generation. She backed up Prince for many years as a background singer. She had big hits in the 80s as a solo artist. Yeah. Um, and so she's coming full circle in her career. And we met out here in Vegas. Cool. Through Steve. Yeah, we met through. And thank you so much for Steve. Steve for hooking this up. Love you, brother. Make the pasta. Make the pasta. I know you're in the grill. So just go ahead and make the pasta. Steve Arnold, right here yes. in Vegas. Man. And so um, it's been wonderful meeting her, working with her. We sang together in a few places, like the Nevada Room, cool. um, which is a small club out here. But she has a sweet, bubbly personality. And she's been at the height of fame with Prince, you know. Yeah. So, um, but we work so well together. She's a tremendous, tremendous talent, tremendous vocalist, and one of the best in the, in the business that I've ever worked with. And 
I've worked with a few. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So it's Myron's in Las Vegas, April yes. 6th. What time does it start? 8 p.m.? 8 p.m. Beautiful. What Myron can people... Vegas, Smith, see the baby. Yes. What can people expect when they come to this show? Well, we're going to be getting our soul full on. People wonder, when you, when you say the word soulful, where does it come from? It comes deep down in your soul. And we're going to fill it up. Just like, and we, you're going to pay your money for your ticket. Yeah. Because you already paid your money for your gas to get there. And you probably screaming <laughs> and cussing while you're in that audience talking about gas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a change. They better be good. Oh, if they ain't good, I'm going to throw an apple at the stage so quick. Hit d train in the head. <laughs> well, man, soulful to me is my history and my legacy at the same time because I can promote what I've learned from Marvin Gaye. I can promote what I've learned from, from even my own experience. And I will be debuting my new single. Um, uh, da, 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 I, that, that's a doggone shame. Now, you know I'm getting old when I don't even remember my own single. Um, wow, I got to go on here and look for it. Um, no. <laughs> My own single, uh, my new single for my new album, which will be released this almost summer, it will be called The Other Side of the Tracks. Yes. And the name of the single that I will be singing at the Smith Center is called Time Has Come Today. So you get a little bit of the new and a little bit of old. You're the one for me. If you love that song, it's going to be in there. But we're going to sprinkle it up. With a little bit of music from Donny Hathaway, Roberta Flack, James Ingram, Patty Austin. Oh, yeah, baby, come to me. Let me put my arms around. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, so it's going to be a mix of old D train, new D train, and all the beautiful, soulful music. In between. Yes. 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 So you mentioned you have an album coming up this sun summer. The album, yeah. the show April 6th. What else is D train up to? Well, right now, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just looking forward to the Smith Center. Yep. Um, I'm doing a bunch of work for a television podcast that I'm working on uh, with some people, and uh, out in LA. Mm -hmm. So, other than that, you know, just getting through the daily grind. Yeah. Creating. You know what? What we do as artists is we always create. Mm -hmm. We never stop creating because when we stop creating, we feel now. Then we feel like we've died. Yeah. You know, it's like Melvin from The Temptation who had the bass voice. When he developed lung cancer, he died quicker simply because he died of a broken heart. Yeah. Everybody around him said, when you can't sing anymore, and he was singing forever since the 50s. Mm -hmm. When you lose your voice and the ability to communicate effectively what you know to do, it takes something away from you. And then you get silent because yeah. now there's nothing left to say. Yeah. You know, it's like Bobby Womack. I got to work with him and, and learn of him many years before he died. Mm -hmm. uh, I met him in New York at the I, at the uh, Mac store down in Soho. Mm -hmm. And then he performed um, at the, uh, the, 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 the wine, what's that? City Winery. Mm -hmm. Came to a show and he said, DJ, come on back to my hotel room. So I went back to his hotel room with his wife, Regina, and we sat up there and we, we hung out with him. And me and him traded war stories from the business, <clears throat> you know? And when you work with old or older artists, I'd say, now I'm one of them, um, mm -hmm. they have stories to tell, right? you know? And we, they trade stories like, like Archie Bell in the Drills tells me about Jackie Wilson, you know? Al Jarreau, yeah. when I got to work with him for Quincy Jones' 75th anniversary, at the Nokia Theater in New York City. And I'm walking in his dressing room and I'm going, Al. I said, oh, Mr. Jerome, so nice to meet me. So so nice to meet you, sir. I always try to be respectful. So he looked at me and he's sitting in the chair reading some music and he goes, what did you call me, man? I said, <laughs> uh, Mr. Jerome, he goes, let me explain something to you. What's your name, son? d -train. My daddy was a Baptist minister. His name was Mr. Gerald. My name is Al, baby. Al. I said, okay, Al. Hey, it's all good. 
Want to go walk it through the garden? <laughs> <laughs> I started singing stuff to him. But I wrote a song off of that experience yes. about how sometimes we are brought up in religious confines. Mm -hmm. And when we break loose, it's a freeing experience because we learn about the world. Going to Great Britain for me with, with my earlier hits, and even today, Great Britain had one chart for all music. I never yes. saw that before. All music was on one chart. It was either good or bad. Mm -hmm. We created country, country western, new country, old mm -hmm. country, fake country, love country. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Same thing with R&B, old school R&B, new yeah. school R&B, lighthearted R&B, crunk R&B, rap, the same thing. We've created so many genres in the pot. We're not going to pay them equally, and there will not be equanimity in dividing of record contracts. That's why record companies are no more. Yeah. Because there was the pie, and we knew the, we knew the, we knew the format in the 80s. You slice that pie in half. The top of the high half of that pie mm -hmm. is rock and roll and pop. Period. Point blank. That's why Adam Ant walking into a record company can get an $8 million contract and they're going to fight with me over $175,000 per album. Crazy. And him too may broke it down to me, God rest his soul. He said, when you break down the bottom half of the pie, you got jazz, you got R&B, you got Latin music, mm -hmm. you got, you know, classical music, you know, and we have to share the bottom part of this pie. Right. Where they don't have to share anything. And their residuals will reflect that. Yeah. And so that was one of my first big lessons in the business. Mm -hmm. Try to get on the pop charge, they try it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, D Train, that is all the questions that I have for you this evening. But guys, don't go anywhere because D Train is going to sing for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Do it. Take it away. Do your thing. All righty. I haven't sung these in a minute, but did you know what? I promised I would do it because I know that we're going to have some fun in a few weeks, and the world is such a good place. I love you all. So I'm going to do one of my classics. This song went to top five in 1985 on the Billboard charts. It's called Something's On Your Mind. Oh, wait a minute. Come on. It means play. <laughs> oh no! Wait, no! Okay. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> Hit the wrong button. Uh, D Train, thank you. Oh, God. Uh. Hit me one more time. Put your hands together. I believe. There's something on your mind, tell me, tell me, just lay it on the line, I believe. There's something on your mind, tell me, tell me, girls are wasting time. You, you've been acting kind of strange around me lately, is there something on your mind? I... I seem to get that feeling every time you're near me that I'm running out of time. How can you walk away and leave me hanging? Or just leave me hanging on? I know oh, there's something going on you just can't hide. Now tell me that I'm wrong. Love is the feeling that we share so long together. Come on. Oh, oh, girl, you can say what's on your mind. We can talk it all out it's no need for you to have what you feel inside your heart. Chicka boom cha, chicka boom cha, chicka boom cha, chicka boom cha. 
for me around the world. This was a universal record, the first universal, aside from You're the One for Me, that was really, really big. It was written by Burt Bacharach and Hal David. And it was originally recorded by Burt Bacharach. Um, and then went on by Dionne Warwick, Isaac Hayes, did a version of it. And my partner Hubert came to me one day and said, you know, D, we got to do a classical standard on our first album. So they know we were for real, man. <laughs> I said, okay. So he calls me up in the middle of the night and he goes, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. I said, you sound like a school kid got some happy lunch and you ain't even the fat kid. What's going on? <laughs> so he said, I saw it on the ceiling. I know what to do. So I went to his house maybe two days later and he played me this track, which I know all of you know, and you can sing along with it. See, this is the best sing-along I got. You can sing along with it, because I know you know the words. They're just three words. Walk on by. Where my strings at? See me walking down the street And I start to cry Each time we meet Walk on by Walk on by Make me leave If you don't see the tears So make me grieve In private position My sphere I break down and cry Walk on by Walk on by Yeah, yeah Walk on by Oh, I just can't get over losing you. So if I seem broken in two, walk on by. Oh, walk on by. Foolish pride is all I have. So let me hide the tears in the sand that she gave me when you said goodbye. Yeah. Let's go. Walk on by. Make believe you don't see tears in my eye. Come on, come on, come on. Walk on by. Make believe you don't see tears in my eye. Don't you walk away from me. Yeah, yeah. If you see me walking down the street. Yeah. And I cry each time that we meet. Make believe. 
Make believe. Make believe you don't see the tears rolling down. Rolling down my cheeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotta walk on. Ha. Gotta keep on moving. You gotta walk on. Woo! There you go. Woo! <laughs> yes, you guys. Yes. <laughs> DJ, I'm gonna be honest with you. This is episode 155, and I've had over 150 people on this show. And wow. I've never had a performance like that on my show with so much energy and positivity and enthusiasm and just like grooving and like. Thank you so much for all of that. I loved it. Oh, uh, well, you know what? Thank you, darling, for having me on the show. And I'm so proud of you. Like I said before, I'm so proud of everything that you've done, your endeavors. And I, you know what? I, you you preach it to the choir. You know the wonderful thing that Catherine Jackson, Michael Jackson's mother, and it said. In a yeah. quote, and that it might even go further back than her. Yeah. When you do what you love, you love what you do. I I can't even think of a better way to end it th than right there. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, D-Train, do you have any final words for the beautiful people that are in this room with us at this present yeah. moment? Absolutely. Um, many of you that have been affected uh, through COVID, through the war in Ukraine and, and everything else that's going on in the world that could be a negative, find the positive in the negative. But yeah. the, where it begins is with you. You have to find that positive note within yourself. Because the world will always paint a dark picture. It always has. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to go away. It didn't go away in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. Because there's always going to be a, a, a something that comes up on the video screen called the television that takes your psychological side of yourself down a notch. Yeah. So if you get up in the morning, sometimes skip watching the news. Put on some meditation music, pray and thank your God and your ancestors for your being. And that way you start off the day clear. Yeah. With prayer and 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 receptive. You're receptive. Your your body's receptive to what is going on around you. See what happens is when you get up, wake up and see the news, the first five minutes of any newscast will depress the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will. Yeah. But when you wake up and you meditate and you pray then you're able to look at CNN in the afternoon. Yeah. You know, and, and, and what happens is we need to start searching as people on in the media in Central for good stories mm -hmm. to counter these bad stories. We got enough bad stories. We got enough of reality television, okay? Yeah. We don't have variety television where we could escape uh, yeah. like we did back in the 80s. That's one of the things I'm working on. We don't have, like, we had the Carol Burnett show. Mm -hmm. We had Hee Haw. We had Benny Hill. Mm -hmm. For God's sake. And he was British, and he came mm -hmm. over here and made us laugh. You know? Um, we had Flip Wilson. And he was the first black man to get his own variety show on television. Mm -hmm. Nat King Cole had a variety show, which was musical, and he was a great singer. So those are the things that we're working on now. But find the light in yourself. Every day, not just some days, because see, some days when you wake up, it's going to feel messed up. You don't feel the same every day when you get up. Some days you wake up, you're like, it's Tuesday. <laughs> 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 Especially if you got to go to a job. You'd be like, dang it, Tuesday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but look at it this way. You woke up this morning. You did. And I'm going to tell you something that my daddy taught me. Any day above ground is a good day. Yes. Any day above ground is a good day because the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So maybe you lost your job through COVID. Maybe you lost your house. Maybe your wife left you or your husband left you. Doesn't mean you can't start again. Yeah. It's all up to you. It's not what happens to you that is the catalyst or the spring, spring thing. It's how you respond to what happens to you. Right. Fall down 10 times, get up 11. Mm -hmm. Get up. I don't care where you live. And you, you can say, well, you know, the odds are against me. My parents weren't this. 
I, I was molested as a child. Uh, I grew up in the ghetto. I grew up in the ghetto. I saw people get their chest cut open. And I was like 13, this dude got his chest cut open. So those are not excuses anymore. What happens is those become crutches. Yeah. Take those crutches, throw them in the corner. Mm -hmm. Start walking. And once you start walking, you'll start running. Mm -hmm. And once you start running, the one thing that I can tell you from being in the gym every day, you start believing. You start believing that you ain't got asthma. <laughs> I can breathe. I can breathe. Okay, can I breathe? <laughs> but you learn more about yourself through your activities because a lot of times we let our career define us. Yeah. We let, we let people tell us who we are. Mm -hmm. And I say to everybody else, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in my segment with this, personality is what you are when everybody is around. Yeah. You could be false. Mm -hmm. Personality is like that guy. Oh man, everybody is a sweet guy. He's a great guy. He may go home and beat his wife and his children. Right. You would never know because you don't live there. Exactly. But character defines you when everyone else leaves the room. Mm -hmm. Character is what makes me go to the gym when ain't nobody watching to get this body together and keep it together. There's nobody praising me on the treadmill. Yeah. There's nobody praising me lifting weights. I don't get a reward other than to look good and feel good. Right. So sometimes you have to do that for yourself and take time for yourself. So many times we're so busy helping this one, that one, the other one. Take time to love you. Yeah. At the end of the day, because if you don't love you, you can't love nobody else. Exactly. Love yourself first and put yourself Absolutely. first. Yes. Oh, my gosh. D-Train, I am so honored to have you on my show. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday evening with me, with Vibing with Ashley Live, episode 155. D-Train, thank you, thank you, thank you. Guys, if you don't already, please make sure to follow my guy, D-Train, below. The new album is coming out this summer. If you're in Vegas, April 6th yep. at, what is the name of the place, uh, April 6th? Smith Center. Smith Center, April 6th. Get your tickets if you're in Vegas. Guys, get your tickets? Yes. I'm a boy. Get, get up on the funky D train. Get up on the funky D train and go see D train April 6th in Vegas. Thank you again, D train. And please come back when the new album comes out so we can talk all about it. Absolutely. I'd yes. love to. I'd yes. love to. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And Thank we'll you, Ash. Thanks, guys. I love you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.